You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. On Monday, Texas Governor Greg Abbott signed a new measure that allows state law enforcement to arrest migrants who enter the U.S. without authorization. Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, AMLO, has accused the governor of using such measures for political gain ahead of the 2024 U.S. presidential election. And he says that his country will challenge the measure. No question that immigration is front and center as we enter the 2024 presidential election. In fact, swing state voters see U.S.-Mexico border security as a greater priority than the foreign policy crises that have increasingly dominated President Joe Biden's attention over the last few months. We're talking Israel, Hamas, uh, and then, of course, what's going on in Ukraine. This according to an October Bloomberg News Morning Consult poll. Well, we've got with us a great voice to help us understand migration and also to help dispel what he argues are common myths and misconceptions around migration. Hein de Haas is professor of sociology at the University of Amsterdam. He's also the director of International Migration Institute and the author of the new book, How Migration Really Works, the facts about the most divisive issue in politics. Professor de Haas, good to have you with us this afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Well, thanks for staying up late in Amsterdam and joining us. We really do appreciate it. Hey, um, if you go back in history for pretty much as long as we've been had historical record, migration has been politically divisive. I mean, this is the type of thing that sparked wars in the past for borders. Um, why has it been so politically divisive? I think Migration is this perfect issue to detract the attention away, distract the attention away from other issues uh, where people are unhappy about. And I think migration is the perfect scapegoat as well. But it also provides an opportunity for politicians to position themselves as strong leaders against a common enemy. So it's very, it is very attractive for politicians to draw the migration card. And we see that all across the West. Uh, but like you said, it's not something new. I mean, if you go a century back in the US, there was a lot of uh, hostility towards southern European migrants, Catholic migrants, Jewish migrants, German migrants, and you see it for all countries. So this phenomenon as such is not new. I think what is worrying is the divisive and inflammatory language we're hearing from politicians. Of course, migration comes with its problems, but it's now being sort of magnified to this essential threat to societies. And I think that is really problematic because the debate is more and more disconnected from what's happening on the ground. Can you walk us through maybe some of the most common misconceptions that you hear about migration and what your responses would be to those? Yeah, no, I think the most common sort of idea that many people share across the political board from from left to right is this idea that a swelling mass of people from poor countries are moving to rich countries and that our borders are increasingly overwhelmed and and it's linked to this idea that poverty inequality warfare um, pushes more and more people to leave their homelands now of course there are issues on the border and certainly in the in the US case that's not something we can ignore but if you zoom a little bit out and you look at the overall volume of migration in the world, we talk about 3% of the world population. And that percentage has remained, remained remarkably stable over the last century, basically. There has been clear shifts in terms of directions of migration, but we don't really have evidence that migration as such is spinning out of control, although you'd get that impression, of, of course, if you look at particular border areas and the issues the US is currently dealing with. But I think if you zoom out, migration is essentially not driven by poverty and misery, the main driver of migration also to the US has always been the economy and particular labor demand. And what you see right now, both in terms of legal and illegal migration in the US, cannot be disconnected to the fact that US unemployment is at a 50 year low right now. Labor shortages are huge. We have uh, an unprecedented peak of vacancies, uh, topic, topping I think 10 million right now, which is really historical record. And these things are connected. So this is not so much about a sort of poverty push, what people think. It is really primarily about there's opportunities. And that's always been the case. It's always been the case with immigration. It sounds like you, and, you're you making the point, Professor, that the U.S. can absorb the immigration that we're seeing. Well, I think the problem is that quite a lot of migration is undocumented. It's about illegal migration. And that reveals, I think, a huge issue all across the West 
that there is simply not enough political support for creating more legal channels for lower skilled migrants. And we need, we saw this with the COVID pandemic, that these people do all sorts of essential jobs in the economy, but this is not the kind of migrants for which we give enough visas, which means that people find other ways to enter countries. And I think that is one of the biggest causes of the surge in border crossings, which you see. Besides, of course, there's also people fleeing conflict. So to put it simply, the best way to really, really curb migration is to wreck your economy. And we see indeed in times with high unemployment, economic recessions, migration goes down. When the economy does well, a lot of people come, and it's partly what you see. And most of the migration also to the US is about legal migration. Legal temporary migrant admissions to the US reached an all-time high under the Trump presidency, up to 6 million. And after a sort of COVID slack, it's back to 5 million over the last year. And it reflects the actually very good state of the US economy. So to put it differently, if you want, if you don't like immigration, that is the price you pay for being a wealthy open market economy as the US, but the same goes for the UK and many other European countries. So under the framework that you're working with that, you know, it, the only way to solve migration, you should, well, one way would be to wreck your economy. Obviously, we wouldn't want to do that in the US. No. But underneath no. Um, your framework, did you come up with ideas or solutions about, I mean, we do have a lot of people trying to cross the border illegally. Yeah. Um, how do you yeah. solve that? How do you even begin to start um, finding solutions for that? Well, you cannot do anything if you don't do anything about the demand factor. And I think what really shows that another thing sort of myth is that, you know, politicians get tougher and tougher on immigration, yet it's true on the level of rhetoric. But if you look at practices, we haven't found in a huge research project any difference between left-leaning and right-leaning politicians in terms of the policies they implement. For instance, a lot of, particularly on the Republican side, you hear a lot of tough talk on immigration. At the same time, labor enforcement is symbolically low. In the whole of the U.S., just one statistic, the number of employers that get prosecuted for employing undocumented migrants is somewhere between 10 and 15 a year, without any zeros wow. added. Wow. It is roughly the same <laughs> chance of being hit by lightning. And that shows to whatever you call it, let's call it the hypocrisy, of politicians that you know have a lot of tough talk to say about immigration, but well, a lot everybody of these are, knows that those. Yeah, and a lot of these, a lot of the yeah. the big examples of this are in actually states where that are most aggressively, um, rhetorically, uh, anti uh, this migration. Who are migrants? Because in order to to actually leave where you were born, leave where you're from, uh, leave your family behind, that takes a a person who's willing to make a lot of sacrifice and 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 do these things and work in my opinion, work very hard. What have you found in your research? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what we find. It was true in the past of Europeans going to the United States. It's still true for migrants. Migrants are what we call a positive selection of people in home countries, which means these are the exceptional people, the entrepreneurial people. 3% of the world population migrates. That means 97% stays home. So migrants are almost by definition those who want to take risks or entrepreneurial who want to improve their lives, and that is still the case by and large. So migrants are a positive sub-selection, and that is actually by researchers found that immigration decreases crime, very contrary to what politicians say, because migrants are often very community-oriented, mm. business-oriented. They don't come to countries to become criminals, and that's why we find in research the exact opposite of what politicians tend to claim. But I want to get back to our conversation with Hein de Haas, professor of sociology at the University of Amsterdam. He's also the director of the International Migration Institute and the author of the new book, How Migration Really Works, The Facts About the Most Divisive Issue in Politics. Professor uh, de Haas joins us from Amsterdam this afternoon. So, Professor, one thing that I wanted to discuss was public opinion and what you found in different parts of the world where you've studied this and how Democrats, how Republicans in the U.S. think about immigration um, as a political issue, because your findings, I think, would surprise a lot of people. Yeah, what is interesting, it is indeed true, as most people would expect, that more Republicans think negatively about migration compared to Democrat-leaning voters who tend to be slightly more positive. But if we look at trends through time, it really becomes interesting. 
in the US, clearly the share of people who look positively at migration on both sides of the political divide between Democrats and, Dem and uh, Republicans is actually growing. So there is no sort of public backlash against immigration, which what you would think if you listen to politicians, and we find the same in Europe. And we can explain that because as people get used to the presence of migrants, fears often they diminish and people start to think more positively about immigration. So there is no big public backlash against immigration. What you see is that the rhetorics have grown increasingly tough by politicians. It is more on the level of political rhetorics that you see this huge polarization be between a sort of pro and anti-migration. But, is, it, but is, that, is that rhetoric working? Does it lead to people changing their minds? Does it lead to public opinion shifting? And does it lead to candidates being elected? Well, in the broad sense, no, but there is, of course, a share of voters that is worried about immigration, that sees immigration as a big threat, and that voters being mobilized. And that is still a significant share. But the interesting thing is that the share of people thinking more positively about migration is actually increasing. It may, of course, be that people on the fringes may be emboldened by divisive inflammatory language. And that is, of course, a problem. It could spark violence and discrimination and racism. But overall, there is no clear trend towards uh, growing xenophobia, growing racism. The trend is rather in the other direction. That is actually very surprising. And what it shows that there is, I think, uh, there is a fair share of voters who wants to hear a different story because this pro-anti-division is simply no, not working anymore. Migration is of all times. Migration comes with its share of problems. It comes also with a lot of benefits, but it's not something we can just think away. And I always say to ask, um, you know, me, for instance, are you in favor against migration? It'd be like asking an economist, are you in favor against the economy? That's not a serious way of talking about immigration. And that is partly why the debate is so incredibly stuck, because both camps sort of dig in, cave in and, and cherry pick evidence. And there are not many politicians who dare to tell the true story about immigration, which by by necessity is a much more nuanced one than one the one we usually hear when we listen to politicians. So what did your findings find with the nuance of who actually benefits from migration in the countries that are bringing people in, that are seeing more migrants? Who benefits there? Well, migrants make the whole economy bigger, basically. So the whole economic pie is simply growing. And if we look at average effects on wages, for instance, we find very, very small effects. And there you can discuss about methods and data, but the, defect, the effect is so small that it is pretty insignificant. When you look at higher and lower incomes, you see a clear difference. It is particularly already affluent that benefit most economically from immigration, because these are, of course, the people using services migrants provide, uh, often owning businesses that help them to boost their profits. But the lowest income earners, amongst whom also many former migrants, so people living on minimum wage, for instance, don't benefit much from immigration. And in some cases, they may lose out a little bit. It doesn't mean that immigration is the cause for the long wage stagnation we have seen for lower incomes in the United States. But it is in a way logical that people who earn really low wages have the feeling, what's in it for me? Because these are also the people who see, of course, the day-to-day -day consequences of immigration uh, in their daily lives. So in that sense, the idea that they don't benefit as much from immigration as already affluent people is correct. But it doesn't mean that migrants take away jobs or are responsible for the long-term wage stagnation that we have seen in many Western countries amongst lower income earners. Professor De Haas, uh Let's say that by some imaginary force, you became in charge of immigration policy here in the U.S. No question we face a crisis at the U.S.-Mexico right. border. How would you solve it? I think I would organize a national debate about immigration, and it is a serious debate. And that should, by definition, be a debate about the kind of society and an economy you want to live in particularly when we look at lower skilled jobs, because there's broad support also in the US to, to allow people to come in who do higher skilled jobs. But it is a fact of life, and certainly in the future, that we need also lower skilled immigrants. So you can only solve this in two ways. Either you create more legal channels for lower skilled workers, that will avoid a lot of 
misery at the border and these policies that we've been trying to implement of border enforcement that go back more than 30 years and we've been trying to do the same again and again and again and it doesn't work because people are still attracted by jobs or you make those jobs um, not available anymore either you enforce labor law you know you you're really going to prosecute employers massively i don't think that is very likely i'd rather have a different debate about the kinds of jobs we create that are jobs that are not attractive for native workers that attract migrant workers we really need to think about how we organize our economy for instance if you think about care uh, who's going to take care in the future of our children uh, our elderly we need a serious debate about immigration where we no longer deny these economic realities and on that basis we can make decisions but we really cannot de divorce the whole debate on immigration from a broader debate how to organize our economy well that's a long story it's a complex story and that is the whole point i think we've seen too many too much politics of denial over the last 30 years and that also explains the mess we're in not just in the us but also in the european union where this real demand for lower skilled labor, which is going to stay because of aging, because of increasing education of the native workforce, all indicators show that we really need to debate about this, but also a debate about work and jobs well, and for instance, minimum wage. These are all connected to immigration. And I cannot explain it fully here. I don't have well, the time, no, but no, I think this is a this serious been, debate. It's, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's been really helpful. And you got to come back and, and join us once again. Hein de Haas is professor of sociology at the University of Amsterdam. Check out his new book, How Migration Really Works, The Facts About the Most Divisive Issue in Politics.